Okay, so um, hello everyone, I'm Larry, and today I'm going to be talking about Yusuko Gold topics that will commonly appear in um, in Gold. And like, uh, if you like, if you don't understand anything, you can feel free to ask me questions about it because because um, yeah, just like don't be afraid to ask me questions about anything that you aren't clear about. So yeah. Um, today, my like presentation will kind of be split into three parts. The first part is going to be like three different, like basically sections in gold. Uh, mostly, you just need to know these three sections. Occasionally, you might need something beyond these sections, but um, anything beyond those sections, you can look at Yusuko Guide for advice as to how to do it. Um, but anyways, the first section is graph algorithms. Graph algorithms used to be extremely popular in gold, but now um, it has fallen off a bit because it's very hard to create an original problem that uses one of these and is also pretty difficult to solve. So it has slightly fallen off a bit, but uh, it's still great to know graph algorithms in case it appears again, because you don't wanna be in a situation where there's an easy problem and you can't solve it because you don't know some of these. So yeah. So the first is Dijkstra's algorithms. And um, it's basically BFS with a priority queue instead. So you store distance node inside a priority queue, and then you visit every node that you haven't visited yet that is connected to the current node that you're um, doing. And then you find like, you basically, keep doing that and yeah so uh, essentially you visit a node visit a node a node which basically means mark the distance and visit like visit node means basically mark the distance and also mark it as visited and then after that you go to all of the nodes adjacent to it that haven't been visited yet and you push those into the priority queue. And the reason a priority queue allows you to solve shortest path on weighted graphs is because uh, it finds the smallest weight every single time, like the smallest total weight. So no matter what, you're always going to get the smallest total distance every single time. And eventually you're gonna get the smallest total distance of the node that you want. So. Yeah, so if you want to uh, find the shortest path between two nodes A and B, you should start your Dijkstra's at A and then propagate all the way until you hit B. And once you hit B, you have the uh, required distance. So yeah. Um, yeah, there are other useful shortest path algorithms like um, Bellman-Ford. And Bellman-Ford is one of the least used algorithms out of all of these but um, it's still part of the gold syllabus. So I'm going to talk about it. Um, essentially, it finds the shortest path between two nodes in a graph with negative edge weights. And so this might be impossible, right? If you have a negative, negative edge weight cycle, then um, you're just gonna keep propagating around that cycle and get a better and better, better answer every time until you like basically get negative infinity, which is not good. So Bellman Ford can help you detect negative cycles. And also if there are no negative cycles, it can find the shortest path. And uh, the way it does this is um, basically it goes through every single, uh, it goes through like, let's say you have a graph. like let's say negative one, two, negative two, and three. Like, let's say this is your graph, right? And you start from this node. Essentially, you have a distance at every moment. So at the start, the distance will be zero, infinity, infinity, and infinity. But then at each moment, you relax every node with each edge going forward and going, or like these should be directed. Let's say they're directed this way. And each time step for every node or for every edge, 
you relax that edge. What does that mean? Well, you basically say, well, if this distance, if this distance is less than this weight or is greater than this weight plus this distance, then we update that. So after the new one, we would get zero, negative one, infinity, infinity. And it's pretty easy to prove that with this kind of thing, it'll propagate at most n times until you either hit a negative cycle or you uh, find the shortest path. And if you hit a negative cycle, that just means um, like if you do it one more time, it'll still propagate, which is not good because it shouldn't. So um, yeah, and if it's like, and if it finds the shortest path, you can just output the distance over here. So yeah, that's Spellman Ford. Floyd Warshall is way, way easier and also way more useful. Um, it relaxes the graph based on each node in between. So for example, uh, like let's say you have an adjacency matrix and like basically it's an adjacency matrix and you have like, Zero, 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 zero. Actually, I drew it too big. You have like zero, 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 one, two, inf, inf, negative one, inf. Um, if you have something like this, then you can just uh, essentially relax it based on every intermediary node. So uh, you fix the intermediary node. So let's say your intermediary node is one. And now you go for every i and j, if this i, i to the intermediary node, which is one, plus this one to j, if this is better than the current path between i and j, if this is better than the current path, then we update the current path. And um, it's actually pretty tough to prove that this works, but uh, if you just think about it like a bit, like um, you can kind of see that um, like, like they're like you're going through every intermediary node. So for every shortest path, every node on that shortest path is going to be gone through. So yeah, it does work with negative edge weights, but it cannot find negative uh, weight cycles. So if you need to find negative weight cycles, then you should use Bellman for it. However, this finds all pair shortest path, like the Basically, it finds the shortest path between every node and every other node. With Dijkstra's, it, uh, it finds single source shortest path. So one source, but it can go to every other node. With Bellman Ford, it's the same thing. One source, but it can go to every other node. With Floyd Warshall, you go from every node to every node. And yeah, that's basically the idea of Floyd Warshall. There's another thing about Floyd Warshall, and it's that uh, if you have positive, if you have only positive edge lengths, then it's actually strictly worse than Dijkstra's because Dijkstra's will do it in at most of n cubed, and most of the time it'll do it in O of n squared log n. So if you really like, like really, you shouldn't be using Floyd Warshall if you only have positive edge weights, basically. But if you have negative edge weights or like directed or whatever, then um, Floyd Warshall is very nice. It's also very, very easy to code. So yeah. Okay. Uh, what? Okay. Oops. Oh, well. Um, uh, this should say, this should say merge small to large. Okay, 
anyways, DSU is uh, DSU is a very efficient algorithm that can find connected components really well. So what it supports is two functions, union and find. Union connects two different connected components based on one uh, two different nodes. So basically finds the connected component that both of those nodes are in and connects them. Find figures out which connected component you are in. So for example, it's basically the root of the whatever tree that you have. So the idea of union find is you start with a bunch of random nodes and then you just start uh, drawing connections. So you draw a connection here, draw a connection here, like draw a connection here. And then suddenly you have connected components. And so every time you draw a connection, you're doing a union. And the, this union is essentially just, um, bit, well, there's a way to make it really efficient, but the naive way is just parent of the root, parent of the first root is equal to the parent or equal to Uh, equal to root the other root basically so this is a very bad implement or not very bad but this is a bad implementation of um of the union function uh, i'll show the better implementation of, in a bit but uh, the naive find function is also very easy, but also very bad. Like you can just do return find, find of parent of I. You can just do this and um, basically call it a day there, but this would be very inefficient. So how would we speed this up? Well, there are two ways to uh, speed this up. The first way is called path compression. Path compression is the, uh, the reason it's really, really hard to prove the time complexity of DSU and people generally black box it. But path compression basically changes this into this. So this is way better because essentially what it's doing is after we found the root, we don't care about what the actual structure of the tree is. So we can just set the parent to be the root. And once we set the parent to be the root, every time, the next time that we access it, it'll be so much more efficient to figure out what the root is. And um, this is a very nice, um, this is a very nice like optimization which can be very, um, it, it's something that's very cool. Like for example, if you had something that looked like this, even after one call of this function, uh, even after one call of find over there, the resulting graph will actually look something like this. So it speeds it up a lot and um, just this optimization alone is enough for log n. But we use two optimizations and we can get better than log n. So what is the other optimization? The other optimization has nothing to do with the find. It has something to do with this, the union. So when we union something, we can union the smaller tree into the bigger tree. And the, the reason this is better is because if we union the bigger tree into the smaller tree, that means that you're adding depth to more nodes. And if you um, if you do the smaller tree, it seems like a trivial kind of thing, but actually you can prove it to be very very effective using uh, exponentiation uh, using an exponential argument, where essentially um, even if you only use merge small to large, um, every time you go up the tree the size of the tree more than doubles. So if you go up the tree, if you keep going up the tree, then 
you can go up at most log n times because there are there are n nodes and it doubles every time. So um, yeah, merge small to large is a very seemingly innocuous optimization, but it does a lot. And it changes our O of log n into O of inverse Ackerman. Um, and the way we do that is we keep another array of the sizes and then we just compare the sizes. So yeah, DSU is very useful. Um, yeah. So now we're gonna talk about minimum spanning trees. Minimum spanning trees are another common topic within gold, which has recently fallen off a decent amount, but you should still know most of these algorithms, even if they're not like, like they're not gonna be something that you code directly because um, the idea behind these algorithms can help you solve many tough problems. Um, oh, geez. Um, the other algorithm, so I said there are three algorithms. The other algorithm, it's also very useful not for its ability to find the minimum spanning tree, but for its like idea of why it's able to, and you can use like the intuition of the proof of the algorithm to be able to solve other problems. So um, yeah, Prim's oh my god, Prim's algorithm is a very simple, I guess, algorithm. The idea is, let's say you have a graph. and you start from this node, right? In order to add another node in, the, no, the edge that you add must be the minimum possible, like the minimum edge out of all the edges that you could possibly have. What do I mean by that? So let's say this one, this edge is smaller than this one. Then we circle this one because we've added it into our MST and we add this to the total cost of our MST. And now we figure out what the new edges are. So now we have this edge and this edge that we need to consider. Let's say this edge is smaller. So we circle this one. And now we have this edge, this edge, this edge, this edge. And um, it, we can propagate through the entire graph. And once we've added all of our graph into the minimum spanning tree, we can just output the total cost that we've computed along the way. And um, yeah, this is generally going to be more useful than the other algorithm, which is Crusco's algorithm, because this one can be, uh, it's O of n log n, or or it's like O of n log n in a, uh, n log n in a sparse graph, because you can use a set data structure to keep everything, but it's also O of n squared in a dense graph, because um, you can just use an array instead, like just cut the log n away from the set and you can get n squared. So this is generally gonna be more useful than Kruskal's algorithm because Kruskal's algorithm, uh, which we'll get to in a moment, can only do it in m log n, which means for dense graphs, it'll always be n squared log n. So yeah. Oh, why isn't it? Okay. Kruskal's algorithm is a much simpler algorithm, however. And the idea of Kruskal's algorithm can be used in a lot of different problems. So that's why we still need to learn what Kruskal's algorithm is. So you can basically take the edge with the least weight every single time, as long as it contributes to the minimum spanning tree. Um, this should be intuitive and also fairly easy to prove. Um, but essentially, we can use this um, to uh, find the minimum spanning tree really quickly. What we can do is we can sort all of the edges within the graph in increasing uh, order of in increasing order of their weights, and then after we do that, we can basically maintain a DSU saying 
whether these things are in the same component. And if they are in the same component, then don't do anything, skip that edge. If they're not in the same component, add that edge, add that weight to that MST and uh, combine those two to uh, make a new component. And essentially, like this is really easy to code. It's just a couple lines. And generally, if you have a sparse graph, people always do cruise goals because it's so much easier to code than Prim's algorithm. Um, however, Prim's algorithm is useful in dense graphs. So you should know both of these. Um, I actually have a comparison slide here. So like in like direct computation, Prim's algorithm is generally preferred to Kruskal's algorithms, but um, the idea of Kruskal's algorithm, the idea of having uh, like having building it up from the least weight to the highest weight is actually more useful than the idea of Prim's algorithm. And the reason is because, um, for example, if it's if you have way too many edges to do in time, if you have way too many edges in, to do in time, and then you try to um, like do an MST algorithm, that doesn't really work. But if you use the idea of Kruskal's algorithm, you can say, oh, what is the least edge? And then keep adding the least edges until you can um, do that. And the, like it could be much easier to calculate the sum of the least edges um, than like something like Prims. So yeah, Kruskal's algorithm is like very useful to know, and so is Prim's algorithm. So here's the first practice problem. Um, I'll uh, send the link in chat. And uh, yeah, which problem is this? Um, you should think about this problem and, oh, we're running very short on time. This is supposed to be the shortest section of my presentation. So, hmm. Anyways, you should try to solve this problem. It shouldn't be too hard, especially given the constraints. So, yeah. Um, I'll talk about it at 2.28. By the way, you should feel free to ask questions or to say whatever ideas that you've had in the chat or else um, you're not really going to get anything from looking at the problem.
Mm -hmm. Okay, so it seems you guys didn't have an idea about how to solve this problem. That's okay. So I'll go over like my thought process in approaching this kind of problem and um, like some of the problem solving techniques that you use to solve these kinds of problems. So the first thing that you realize in this problem is that dealing with the costs is extremely easy. But once you find the shortest path, how do you find the like the minimum flow? What if the answer's not including, like what if the answer doesn't involve the shortest path? Like, how do you do that? So the flow is the blocking point of our problem. And so if we consider the blocking point of our problem, which is the flow, what if we fix what the flow we want is and then try to solve the problem given that we need this flow to be uh, what it is. And like, basically, instead of making the flow the variable, you fix it and you make the cost the variable because it's easier to deal with the cost. And so the way we do this is consider a flow that we, uh... oh my God. Oh my God, what is happening? Uh, okay. uh, I'm afraid of my mouse now, but anyways, um, basically what we want to do is we fix a flow, but how do we do that? Well, for each edge, we just delete it if the flow doesn't satisfy that requirement. So for example, like we want to go from A to B b right but let's say that we need we uh, require ourselves to have a flow of at least five and let's say these two edges don't meet that requirement then we can basically get rid of those edges and then find the shortest path and then once we do that we can just divide that or use the flow divided by the shortest path to find um, the basically the best answer in this case the shortest path is infinity so the flow divided by the shortest path would just be zero and that is definitely not going to be our answer so um yeah basically delete all the edges with flow less than a certain number and then run a dijkstra's to find the shortest path and then yeah and so the way we can do this in o of n squared is we can just get rid of all of the edges that um, we can just get rid of all of the edges one by one. So instead of getting rid of half the edges every single time, um, we basically go up. So let's say our initial flow requirement is zero. So we have every edge, but then our flow requirement increases to the next smallest. And then we get rid of one of that edge. And then uh, it increases again. We get rid of another edge. And then we keep getting rid of edges until there are no more edges left. And then um, after we do that, we can just easily figure out that the answer is the best of all of those numbers that we've calculated. And yeah, this uh, problem is one of the easier graph problems, I guess, you would face. There's some other problems where you would have to generate all of the possible shortest paths or generate the lexicographically smallest shortest path, which is much, much harder than this. And so um, this is kind of a problem of uh, problem solving strategies. You figure out what's blocking you, which is the flow, and then you isolate the flow and leave the cost, which is much easier to deal with, uh, to like be the variable. And once you've isolated the flow, it becomes really easy. Uh, <sighs> what is happening? Uh, technical difficulties. Anyways, um, let's do the sec. What is happening? Okay, let's do the second problem. I've sent it in chat and 
yeah, you might have seen the solution already because um, my mouse, but yeah. Um, I'll give you until 2.36 to think about this problem. Remember, you should try to send all the ideas that you have about the problem in chat because that's the way you learn. And even if you're wrong, you can learn a lot from your mistakes. Okay, so now that you guys have thought about this problem, potentially the hardest part about this problem is to figure out how to um, do it in time. Like everyone can find an O of n squared solution, it's just Prim's algorithm, but how can you use this n squared solution to find an even better solution? Well, the idea is to abuse one of the weirdest, like basically you wanna make observations about the problem. And one of the first things you realize about this problem are the really, really strange constraints. They made X up to 10 to the six, but they made Y up to only 10, which means that we can take advantage of this using, um, using using some way and use that to somehow optimize our time. How would we do that? Well, uh, one of the easiest ways we can do that is we can just go, let's say we have, um, so let's say we have uh, a bunch of rows of, you know, rows of, We have a bunch of rows of like points, right? And uh, we have like these two points. Uh, 
let's just draw the points on the first row and the second row. In a normal circumstance, if we didn't know anything about the MST, we would have to add the edge between every single pair of all of these points. But clearly, some of them are very extraneous. We would never want to connect these two points, for example. We would never want to connect these two points. So what edges can we tell definitively are extraneous? Well, what we can do is um, we have an observation about the problem. So the observation is that, is that if we have an edge from here to here, and an edge from here to here, and an edge from here to here, it is easy to see that this edge, let, let's call this edge A, this edge B, this edge C, it's easy to see that C is greater than A and C is also greater than B, right? But if C is greater than both A and B, think about how Kruskal's algorithm works. If A and B are both smaller than C, we'll get to the edges A and B before we get to the edge C, which means that no matter what, these two nodes will be connected by the time we get to this edge. And that means that the edge will never be useful. So that means that, uh, let's erase some of these things. So, oh no. So that means that, uh, as we can tell, we can only have uh, we can only have for for an edge to contain this, it can only be within the range of this. Because only nodes within here, will not have extraneous edges from this node. Um, and um, once we do this, we can kind of easily prove that we'll only have at most 11 n edges. And once we prove that, then uh, we can just run either prims or criticals and we can solve the problem in O of n log n time. So the idea here was to take advantage of a really strange constraint that y is less than or equal to 10 and use that to our advantage to abuse that fact and basically allow ourselves to improve the complexity of our solution. So yeah, um, trees. So trees can occasionally appear on gold uh, it may be nice to know some properties, but I don't think they will include trees on gold that much because trees on gold is usually going to be way beyond the scope of gold. So yeah, the only two uh, decent problems or the only two problems in recent memory, at least, that involve trees are milk visits. and Cowland, and both of which are beyond the scope of gold. So I don't know whether there will be any tree problems, but anyways, it's very useful to know some of these tree things. Okay. Um, okay. So <clears throat> basically a tree, the basically the most uh, universal, uh, like the most universally or the most universally useful fact within a tree is that between any two nodes, there's only one shortest path. And this allows us to use range queries in a really, really complex way. Most of these ways involve um, lowest common ancestor, which is beyond the scope of gold. And many of these um, use like various really complicated techniques to find properties on trees, which we'll not go too deep on. The most common and basically only algorithm required for trees, well, one of them is DP, which we'll talk about later. 
but the other one is an Euler tour. And an Euler tour is essentially a way to flatten out the tree into just an array. So consider what would happen if we did this. We had a tree over here. Let's say it looks like this. It doesn't matter. Trees are always, almost always unweighted. And yeah, trees are almost always unweighted. And even when they, uh, even when they are weighted, the weight usually doesn't really matter to basically anything besides finding the actual answer. And uh, so we can basically do uh, an Euler tour. So we start at the root, uh, which you can usually arbitrarily pick, and then we go down the tree. So we would start at one, and then we basically run a DFS. So we go down to two, and then we record that down. We go down to three, we record that down. Then we go back up to two, we record that down. Then go down to four, go up to two, then go up to one, then go all the way down to five, and then back up to one. And this would be our Euler tour. Um, there are other ways to do this. Like for example, you don't need to go back up to two. So sometimes people will do one, two, um, and then here they'll go down to three, four, but they won't go back up to two in between. So yeah, and then they'll put a two at the end, then five, one. This is another way to do an Euler tour. They're different, uh, they're di useful in different circumstances. And basically, the way we can utilize this kind of flattening of the tree is through a very, uh, is through basically we can use range query data structures. So let's say we wanted to find the sum or something like that. We can use a binary index tree over these to find like, oh, this range or whatever range, you know. Actually, so. Actually, this isn't that useful. I think the more useful version is if you repeat the threes so that uh, you know you're exiting. So the repeat is an exit. So for example, if you wanted to do an XOR over this, you would just find the XOR of this, like from two to five or... Yeah, something like that. And then you can basically find the XOR of all of these things. Um, yeah, uh, but generally, like, th that's the only thing that would ever be useful in trees, so, um, yeah. I don't think you should expect trees to show up, but just in case they do, think about Euler tours, think about how to abuse the fact that there's only one shortest path within every two nodes, and it's not working again. Okay. Um, yeah, that was a lot. Do you want to take a break or do you want to just keep zooming through this? Because we still have two sections to cover and that was uh, the shortest section. So, yeah. Um, okay, let's just keep trying to zoom through all of these. As I alluded to earlier, um, one of the most common data structures within gold is a binary index tree. A binary index tree is um, basically one of the, like, it's basically the first data structure that you have to code yourself. Um, in silver, generally, you're able to use STL. So you're able to use a standard, like, sets, maps, priority queues, queues, stacks, stuff like that. You don't really need to code your own data structures. But in gold, now you need to code some of your own data structures. And a binary index tree is not within, like, it's not within the standard library. And uh, this is because it can be very easily modified and there's no reason to have a binary index tree for addition, subtraction, multiplication, uh, XOR, whatever, whatever, whatever. Like, there's no reason to add it in because the people who are going to use it probably know about it. So you should definitely know about binary index trees. What is a binary index tree? 
Well, basically, the goal of a binary index tree is to solve the following situation. You can update any element in the array, and you want to output the sum of all the elements in any range in the array. You might think, oh, prefix sums. We learned this in silver, right? But how would prefix sums handle updates? It's going to be so hard for prefix sums to be able to update any element because if you update an element, you have to change the prefix sum for everything after the array, after in the array. And there's no really clean way to use prefix sums to solve this question. So, so in order to solve this, we need to use binary next trees. It's not working again. What is a binary index tree? Well, a binary index tree is something that looks like this. You have a tree, or it's not really a tree, but each node consists of a range of different nodes. And this idea is very common within many data structures. Um, uh, if you learn about plat algorithms, then you might, um, you might stumble upon segment trees or other things like that, which use the same idea. But every node corresponds to a range within the binary index tree. And using this range, we can basically do a lot of cool things. Um, the first thing you might realize is that the endpoints are all distinct. Like if you realize the endpoints of all of these ranges are all distinct. This is fairly easy to see and also very easy to prove. Um, and generally we mean bit R is equal to the, uh, the is equal to the range, range at that range at ending at. Ending. at R. Um, yeah, and uh, there are very, like there are a lot of bit tricks that we can do to essentially quickly figure out everything. So um, we can essentially, we can basically figure out the sum, the prefix sum over a certain element. And this is the idea of the whole thing is, we can basically split it into whether it's on one side or the other side. If it's on, if it's on this side, so like we split it in half. If it's on this side of the half, then we add this, and then we basically shorten it to this. And if it's on the other side, we don't add it, and then we go down the tree. And this is a common, um, this is a common idea among many different data structures that you will eventually learn. Um, yeah. So uh, I've actually written all the math on the next slide. So here you have the math and the implementation. So here you see um, I've drawn the binary index tree structure. And then um, what you realize is level is this. I've written this down. And what do I mean by that? Well. Uh, level is this, this is the length of the range that you have. What does this do? Well, it's over here, right? Negative x is equal to the flip of x plus one. And once you realize that this is equal to the lowest set bit, we can easily see that, you know, this is true. And then using this, we can have the query. So uh, the query should be self-explanatory once we've seen this, because if we subtract this, like the length is this. So we're basically going to the next one that ends where we started. And the update, basically um, we can homogenize it. So we can get rid of all of the zeros at the end, or I guess de-homogenize it. Uh, we'll get rid of all of the zeros at the end. And then we realize that it has to be like R has to be odd, but then that means that, yeah, R has to be odd, but that means that if we add R and minus one, R would be even, and that would also include it. So, uh, yeah. 
So the I or or I guess I explained that poorly. So here, let's say we're here, right? No matter where we are, we assume that x is within this range. If we go to the next range, r plus equals to r n minus one, we can basically dehomogenize it so that r is odd, and that means that we're basically adding one. And when we're adding one, we're going to the next level and we're going to start at the same place and end over here. And yeah, that's basically the math behind it. The implementation, as you can see over here, is very short. It's two lines for the query and two lines for the update, basically. So um, it's a very useful data structure to just have like muscle memory, or you can just like, remember to do all of this like but it's very useful and um generally the math behind the binary index tree is not useful at all it's just cool to know the math but what is useful is actually the data structure and what it does so um yeah i went over this already so um yeah, applications. The proof and code of a binary index tree is hardly useful to know, right? We can just like black box it. We can remember what the code actually is, but we don't remember why it's correct, how it does it, whatever. But we need to remember how would we use this data structure. And um, the way we would use this kind of data structure is through um, either we can like process elements in a uh, weird order. Like if we process elements in a sorted order, then we might need to uh, update elements in between and do range queries and stuff like that. Or it could just be a really uh, clean way to optimize uh, uh, a dynamic programming solution, or it could be whatever, right? So there are many ways and many common ways that people use BIT, or, which is the short of it. It's also called Fenwick trees. So if you ever see that word, then you know what it's referring to. Um, and yeah, we'll go over two of the, two of the more common uses of binary index tree. So the first one is inversion counting. This one is one of the most classic binary index tree problems that exist. So yeah, you guys should try this one. I'll give you until like 257. Okay, um, again, you guys shouldn't be afraid to use chat as a tool. You can ask questions, you can, you know, propose your ideas, you can do whatever. Um, don't like, okay, whatever. Anyways, let's get back to this problem. So how would we do this problem? 
Well, the idea is to process every element in sorted order or decreasingly sorted order. It doesn't really matter. <clears throat> so we can, geez. we can maintain a binary next tree over whether we've added an element or not. If it's added, it's one. If we have not, it's zero. Then when we uh, insert uh, the elements in decreasing order, we realize that every element that is greater than it, the element is marked with a one and every element that's less is marked with a zero. So the number that is greater and with lower index is just a query of the binary index tree at that index. So we can basically keep adding it and then just uh, query at that index. And summing over all of these indices gives the answer. So yeah, um, fairly straightforward problem. Um, there shouldn't be much confusion here, I guess. So yeah, this is the next one is a real useful question, but it essentially is the exact same idea. So give you a couple minutes to think about this. Hmm. Again, you should use chat as a resource. Don't be afraid of it. But anyways, uh, I'll go over the solution. It's basically the exact same. Um, you can find the number of cows to the left that are greater by using the same trick. And then after we do that, we can easily figure out whether a cow is unbalanced. And then once we do that, we're basically done because we can just sum out sum the number of cows um, that are unbalanced and we find the answer. So yeah. Okay, um, dynamic programming. Dynamic programming is a way to speed up recursion through process of called memoization. Um, Basically, what does that mean? Well, we store all possible states within a big array. States basically like, um, basically like given these two inputs, what would our answer be? Given, or given these three inputs or given these 20 inputs or whatever. Um, and then you have a transition, which is like basically, okay, well, we go from these two inputs to which other two inputs. And then uh, base case is basically to make your program have a starting point. It's actually very important to make sure all of your base cases are correct because that is a very common source of debugging errors. But um, base case generally doesn't receive much thought when you're actually trying to solve the problem. There are two ways to implement DP. Tabulation, which is bottom up, and it's essentially a way to start from the base case and work your way towards the answer by solving every other possible state. And then recursion is top down. So um, it starts with the answer and then it, it calculates, oh, I need to go to this, this, and this. So I'll go to that. And then from there, we go all the way down to the base case. Then once we get to the base case, we trickle back up and eventually figure out what the answer is. And yeah, um, yeah. There are many ways to try to attempt to solve a DP problem, but the first, 
for the first step must be to identify that it's DP. Usually that means eliminating greedy two pointers, math, or any other easy way to just cheese out the problem um, and uh, prove why it doesn't work. And once you prove why it doesn't work, you use that as kind of like motivation for the DP. So you use that to use this, find the states. We can, um, from those states, try to find an effective transition that is efficient and, <clears throat> and actually works. And, um, and after that, we can, we need to find the time complexity. So like, uh, basically it's the time complexity of your transition times the number of states. So time complexity of your transition, let's say it's O of N and the time complexity of your states is, let's say it's O of N squared. So your total time complexity is O of N cubed. If that doesn't work, you need to find something better implement or just, um, or just like optimize it somehow. Um, and if it does work, you just implement it. So yeah, there are a few common DP, like not really tricks, but DP like themes where um, you have a specific way of like solving DP. And these are like specific ways to optimize or have a better DP. The first one is range DP, which, uh, which shouldn't be in the scope of gold, but is. Um, Bitmask DP, which is um, which is pretty clever, and data structures, which is uh, just basically a way to optimize your DP. Um, yeah. So range DP is not a common trick, but a reason like it has appeared in Usico like this past year, I think. So you should know it, but it's also like not too common. So yeah, you should just like keep this in mind when you're trying to solve a problem. But the idea is to, is that like, if you have like overlapping things where if you have do one of them first, that's okay. And that'll like do something, right? Like it's a range. And then after that, you have ranges on top of that. Um, you'll see with the example problem, but like you have like overlapping ranges and stuff like that. If you have that and the conditions allow for um, like, let's say N is 500, which allows for N cubed, then range DP is a very um, potent way of trying to solve the problem. So essentially your DP is um, the answer over that like, that sub uh, sub segment of the array, and and the way you can kind of find the answer to that sub segment of the array is to like basically iterate through all of the numbers in the middle and then split it at that point. So um, there's like a lot of ways to like like let's say you have a range and you find something in the middle which splits like the ranges that can occur after it, then, you know, you can do that kind of thing. So, yeah. And, uh, yeah, there's not much else to say for range DP. So I guess the explanation for why it would be useful is kind of, kind of bad, but you'll see like all of those themes show up in the example problem. So this is the example problem. You can think about it for a bit. And um, uh, let's get back at like 3.11. Um, yeah, don't be afraid to use chat as a way to share your ideas with everyone else.
Okay, so now that you guys have thought about this problem, let's talk about it. Like this is like kind of like a perfect example of exactly when to use um, range DP. So yeah, so the idea behind this problem is that we basically want to split into a range because we know that um, we have a bunch of overlapping ranges. And in addition to that, we know that each range, let's say we have a range like this, each range cannot have anything that looks like this. And the reason it can't have anything that looks like this is because, well, why can't you just have something that ends here, right? If we just have something that ends here instead, then this would just be so much, like it would be the same thing, except we would just have to worry about less circumstances. So either a range is completely contained within another range, or the two ranges don't overlap at all. And in this situation, that's perfect for range DP because now we can basically split it into two different circumstances. Either we have a range that covers the entire length and um, basically covers the endpoint as well. So we get rid of those and we just have a smaller array. Or we can split the segment in two. And because we know that there are no, like nothing that goes like this, this, right? Because we know nothing goes like that, we can split it into two and still cover, oh, okay. We can split it into two and still cover every possibility. So yeah. And um, basically using that observation, <sighs> okay, using that, we can, we basically already have the transition over here and our state is just the range DP. So we can just use that to derive a DP to solve the problem. Um, yeah. Now let's look at the next common idea, which is bitmass DP. And <clears throat> bitmass DP is basically an idea where um, you want to brute force it, but it doesn't quite work. And um, you need to somehow do DP where you can either take or not take um, like a bunch of items, like 20 different items. And the way you do that is uh, with a bit mask. So a uh, bit mask, if you know what it is, is essentially if you write it in binary, it's like one, one, zero, one, one, zero, 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 one, zero, zero, one, something like this, right? And the way you would use a bit mask is, this is just a number. So you can have this as the parameter of an array, but at the same time, you can also look at each individual bit. So this is take, take the first item, don't take the second item, do not take. And then we can keep doing that for every item. And we can basically get a state, which is just one number, which makes our implementation much cleaner. But also it can represent whether you take or not take 20 different items. And um, yeah, one of the most obvious, uh, obvious indications of bitmass DP is if you see n is less than or equal to 20. And so because it's so obvious once you see n is less than or equal to 20 that you should use bitmass DP, um, people usually disguise it really, really, really cleverly. And well, you'll see what I mean um, in the example, but um, yeah, the disguise, in order to disguise n is less than or equal to 20, it's very, very clever. But once you're able to figure out your state with the bit mask and whatever else you need in the parameter, which is up to n squared, it's really sometimes really, really easy to go from one bit mask to another bit mask. And this allows us to do bit mask DP. Like for example, if we had a bit mask 
and we wanted to generate all of the like or we wanted to let's say uh consider taking the next item then if we take the next item we just add two to the i and if we don't take it we just keep it the same so yeah um yeah there's not much else to say let's look at a sample problem um i'll give you guys until 3:20 to think about this problem i should send this in chat what is happening Okay, so now that you guys have thought a bit about the problem, you can kind of see what I mean by how easy it is to disguise the n is less than or equal to 20 because all they said was the letters in Mildred will not appear. Which, or yeah, I think it was the letters in Mildred will not appear. Let, let me see. Yeah, uh, it just says the letters that appear in Mildred's name will not appear in anything. And that's a really, really great, um, that's a really, really great, like, disguise because if you see, oh, the alphabet, that's 26. 26, I can't, you know, do anything with 26. But then you read, None of the letters in Mildred's name 
and then you realize, oh, then there's n equals 20. And there we can use bitmask dp. And once you figure that out, it actually becomes fairly easy. You make an observation that if you have uh, if you have like a if you have a before b inside your inside your alphabet, then uh, each time you have b a that increases the number of um, things by one. And uh, if you have b before a, then every time you have a b that increases the number by one. And so now you can do a really quick um, a really quick bitmass dp using this. So um, uh, the way you do that is you look at the alphabet, right? And you basically say, well, I fill in the first few letters of the alphabet. Which ones have I used? So out of the 20, which ones have I used in the first few letters of the alphabet? And then for the next letter, I can just basically find, okay, so this is uh, character X. This is character Y. So uh, basically, once I have that, I add number of times y appears right before x. And for every x within here, and then we basically have our solution. Um, yeah. This is a very, very clean, I guess, problem. But the hardest part is just to realize that um, the hardest part is just to realize that you should use bitmass DP to solve this problem. So, oh, I just skipped that. Um, the last thing I wanted to talk about was using data structures as an optimization. So generally, if you have a DP that has a transition that takes like O of N time, or O of n squared time, or a massive amount of time, usually you can optimize that transition into O of one or O of log n using the various forms of data structures. So you can use prefix sums, you can use binary index trees, you can use RMQ data structures, you can use a bunch of different types of data structures. And these generally are good enough to optimize your code from you know, like O of N transition into O of log N transition. And if you aren't able to do that, maybe you should rethink your state or maybe you should rethink something else. So yeah. Um, yeah, that's the end of DP. Um, other useful strategies. Um, math, many gold problems require a strong foundation in math. It can be DP optimizations, observations, or special algorithms. Uh, for math, you should really know number theory, combinatorics, and game theory. But other forms of math, like algebra, can really help with DP optimizations. And generally, in general, practicing math can help you find observations much more easily. But um, yeah, and the other thing was every point counts. Even if you can't solve a full problem, you should still try the subtasks at the bottom of the problem. And many of these subtasks lead you towards the final solution. And they also are really easy to get, like generally much easier than that problem itself. So if you try for subtasks, you might get led to the final solution, or you just might get a butt ton of points just because you did the subtasks. You should also spend your time very wisely because, <clears throat> because when you uh, try one problem for too long, you're eventually going to start like thinking of the exact same thing every time. So you can take a break from the problem by trying a different problem. And then after you've done that, you've like finished that or you get stuck on that, you, you might go back to the problem you got stuck on and try a new perspective. And that might open... Uh, a door and help you solve the problem. Um, yeah, thank you for listening. Uh, and I have a load of problems over here. So.